محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه المنتجبين May the peace and the blessings of our Lord be always with you surrounding you, you my dear sisters and brothers One of the most important principles of Islam that had been advocated and promoted by Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is the principle of justice. This universe stands on justice. If there is no justice, the universe is going to collapse. God created the cosmos system, the universe, and he extended forth the balance, the scale, the justice system. <laughs> Only through the system of justice, the whole universe is functioning, is standing, is operating. Therefore, we believe in justice and we have to be advocates of justice. We have to practice justice and justice has many dimensions. Justice with yourself first, justice with others, justice with your Lord, with the community, with the environment. These are many aspects of justice in this life. And when we open this book, we find many chapters and passages in this book that encourages people to practice justice, reminds them always that be just. One of them is in chapter 57. God says the reason I sent many prophets, apostles, messengers, scriptures, books, for one reason. لَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا رَسُولَنَا بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ وَأَنزَلْنَا مَعَهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْمِيزَانِ لِيَقُومَ النَّاسُ بِالْقِسْتِ So people live up to justice. Respect justice, spread justice, advocate justice. لِيَقُومَ النَّاسُ بِالْقِسْتِ Social justice. And this was the core of the message of Islam. Prophet Muhammad came to a, a society that was ravaged by pride and a prejudice and injustice and oppression and arrogance. So he came to change that system. He came to refurbish that society. He came to bring social justice to that society, society that was based on a class. People were divided into different classes. A society that believed in slavery. Many of them were enslaved. Many of them had no freedom, no respect, no place in the society, just because they are not born to this family and that family. A society that took a pride in the tribal values, in the blood, in race, in color, not in the human values. And this is why God sent the Prophet. People in Mecca, they had money, they had businesses. They had two types of caravans, businesses, trades between the north and the south. They had money. They had good economy. They had many families, but they did not have justice. That society was based on oppression, on exploitation. Men would exploit women. The rich would exploit the poor. The white would exploit the colored or the black. The Prophet came to change that society. That is not a human society. There is no such enjoyment in a society dominated by injustice, oppression. You would not enjoy life. If someone now does something wrong to you and you feel you've been wronged, you would not enjoy your day. Even if you have food and a drink, even if you have shelter, but if you don't have respect, if your rights have been usurped and taken away from you, you don't enjoy your life. So the core value of Islam 
is to bring back justice. Because it is through justice and social justice, life can develop its own meaning and people can progress in this life. Of course, many people didn't like that. Many people, they lived in a culture for so many years. They embraced oppression. They thrived on oppression. And they did not like the idea of equality. And that idea of discrimination lasted even after the death of the Prophet. Prophet Muhammad was able to, to bring some, some sort of social reconciliation between people. But he was not completely successful because many people, they didn't like his idea. Many people, they wanted to remain as they are. Many people believed in slavery. Many people still today, they believe in the supremacy of the blood and the race and the color, not the faith, not the humanity. Prophet Muhammad had very difficult time with his community. Some Muslims, when they look at the Islamic history back during the time of the Prophet or the Caliphate, they think that time was the golden age. It wasn't the golden age. It was mired by challenges and problems. But the Prophet was patient because he has a message. He came to change the people, to transform them, to make them better human being. This is why the Prophet, Prophet's message was advocating the primacy of not a tribe, not the blood, not a race, not a specific culture, the primacy of the humanity. He tried to teach people that you have to be global and universal in your outlook, in your perception. The way you look at the humanity, there is no preference. There is no superiority and inferiority in any race, in any culture. In the eyes of God, we are all equal. There is only one distinction, and you know what is it. And it is mentioned in this book, in chapter 49, Surah Al-Hujurat. يا أيها الناس إنا خلقناكم من ذكر وأنثى وجعلناكم شعوبا وقبائل لتعارفوا فيرلي إن أكرمكم indeed the most honorable among you in the eyes of God إن أكرمكم عند الله أتقاكم the one with more piety and righteousness and dedicate dedication if you have more dedication more sincerity more righteousness, then you are favored with God. But if you don't, if you count on your wealth, on your family, on your house, on your career, on your blood, then this is not a reason for, for you to be proud of. And the Prophet exhibited that, exhibited that equality. When he lived in the community, the Prophet surrounded himself with different people. Some of them, they came from Africa. They were black. Some of them from the Roman Empire. Some of them from the Persian Empire. Some of them from poor and neglected families in Arabia. Different parts of the world. They became the family of the Prophet. Some people came to the Prophet, they said, Ya Rasulullah, Bilal, the guy who raises the Adhan every time, he doesn't speak good Arabic. His Arabic is broken. He has severe accent. He cannot say, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah. He cannot say, he says, Ashhadu. The Prophet said, Sinu Bilal and Sheenun Allah. Don't worry about it. Yes, he says Ashadu, but when it gets to God, it turns into Ashadu. It's a lesson that I don't care about the accent. I don't care about the color or the blood. I care about your spirit, the heart that you carry, the dedication that you have, the sincerity, the ikhlas that you have. People are equal in the eyes of God. Today we have a problem in the Muslim community. The problem of racism. 
We do have racism. In many Muslim societies, racism does exist. Race is something important to them. You go to certain Muslim countries, they say, number one people are our people, our culture, our language, our blood, and our race. You go to the next door country, they say exactly the same. You go to the third one, they repeat the same cliche. And this is why we have conflicts. This is why Muslims cannot achieve unity among themselves, let alone others, because they have an outstanding problem called racism and a prejudice. Prejudice. They have narrow perspective. Islam came to remove that narrow perspective. Islam came to say that the family, the real family is the whole humanity. The entire creation falls into two categories. Either they are your brothers and sisters in faith. If not, if they have different faiths, or if they have no faith, then they are your equal counterparts. So they deserve respect. They deserve attention. They deserve that you give them equal rights. Social justice is the core of religion. A religion, a society that neglects social justice is not an Islamic society. Even if they pray five times a day, even if they fast the whole month of Ramadan, even if you hear the Adhan constantly from the minarets being raised, but if they don't respect social justice, social justice, then that is not an Islamic society. What does social justice mean? Social justice means that every citizen of the country, every citizen of the society, they are treated equally. They have equal access to food, to job, to education, to health care, to traveling, to politics, to everything. One aspect of social justice is gender equality. Gender equality is missing in many Muslim countries. Gender equality is missing today in many Muslim countries. Men and women are not treated equally. Women are always behind. Our societies, they are still a patriarchy where women have to be sub subservient to men. And that is contrary to the spirit of this book the teachings of this book. Whenever God speaks about men and women, He brings them together. In the eyes of God, we are together. In our creation, we are equal. In our responsibility, we are equal. When we go back to God, we are equal. Nowhere this book says, men are above or better than women. Nowhere. This is our own interpretation. Human's interpretation. Even if they are scholars, even if the human is faqih or mushtahid, does not mean that he's always right. Because some faqih, jurist, mushtahid, it's like a lawyer, sometimes incorporates his own desire. He doesn't necessarily speak on behalf of God. They incorporate their own understanding, their own society, their own values. So they give preference to men over women. But when you look at the book and examine the book, there is no preference. Sometimes women could, could be much better than men. God is genderless. God has no preference when it comes to gender. He says, I look at your heart, your work, your production, your sincerity, your ikhlas, what you do in this life for others. I, I consider these things. I'm not looking at your gender, whether you are male or female, whether you are rich or poor, whether you are black or white. What is important for me is your work. Is your work. God is going to observe God, his apostle, and the family of the Prophet. Mu'minun, Imam al-Sadiq says, نحن المؤمنين. In this context, we're going to observe and appreciate what you do. So gender equality is important. 
We have to encourage our societies. If we want to enjoy Islam, and if we want people not to desert Islam and leave Islam, we have to incorporate gender equality. We have to give women their rights that they deserve and what God has given them. We have to, have, we have to give them what they deserve. Gender equality is important. Political equality is important. Social equality is important. These are aspects of social justice. No society can thrive without social justice. Today when we have, why do we have problems in Muslim countries? Why until today, many Muslims, they leave their birthplaces, their homes, their countries, and they come, they seek refuge here in Europe. Are they coming here because of the weather? They come to these countries because of respect, because of human rights, to gain their rights, their respect, to speak their mind. Because many of them, they live under dictatorships. Many of them have no rights. Not alone women that have no rights. Even men have no rights. Children have no rights. Animals have no rights. Nobody has rights. When we don't incorporate this book and respect this book, where it says, where it says, لِيَقُومَ النَّاسُ بِالْقِسْطِ We want people to live up to live up to social justice, so they can spread social justice. If you don't do that, you're going to damage yourself and damage your community. And then you're going to flee that country and try to find somewhere else to live where there is social justice. Sometimes we find there is social justice, more social justice in some non-Muslim societies than Muslim societies. Because of social justice, people are leaving. Because of lack of social justice, many people are leaving their own countries. Their forefather countries, they abandon them, they seek refuge elsewhere. Because they give them their rights. Social justice is important. One of the things that we, especially the young generation here, you must learn, is that we treat all people equal. Maybe back home, you are from Afghanistan, you are from Iraq, you are from Lebanon, you are from Iran, you are from Morocco. You have different cultures. But here you are one nation. You are one citizens. In the eyes of God, we are equal. This is exactly this, the, the kingdom of God. This is how it operates. In the kingdom of God, there is equality. People are all equal in the kingdom of God. Many of you probably heard the story when Imam Ali salam became the Caliph. His Caliphate lasted for four years and nine months in the city of Kufa. And in that city there were many nationalities, many races, many religions too. There were some Jews, there were some Christians, there were some atheists too. And they used to practice their religion, no problem. When we read the history of Imam Ali, we, we find out that he would walk in the market and he finds a Christian man and he would talk to him and he would defend him. One day he saw a man asking for help, an elderly man. The Imam said, what is this? Why should a man stand in the market and ask for help? Why you have neglected this man? They said to him, he's a Christian, don't worry about him. He's a Christian, innahu nasrani. He said, even worse. This is even worse. When he was young, you utilized his energy. He was serving this society. Now that he's old, you neglected him? So you have to give him a salary from Beit al We are responsible for him. I don't look at his religion. His religion is not important for me. I look at this person as being a human. A human who deserves respect, who deserves rights, who deserves attention. The other time Imam Ali was taken to court. 
by a Jewish man. He took Imam Ali to the court. And Imam Ali had appointed a judge, a judge being appointed by the Imam himself. And Imam Ali stands as a defendant in the court. And that man, the Jewish man, he's the plaintiff because he took the Imam to the court. So Imam came to the court. The judge said to Imam, you have to come to the court. And he's Amir al mumini And the judge was addressing them. He would call their names. So he called the Jewish man by, by his name. But when he came to Imam Ali, he called him by his title, Ya Amir al mumini Imam Ali said, no, 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 no. You don't call me Amir al mumini in the court. In this court, I'm an ordinary citizen. You call me by my name. You call me by my name. I'm in the court now. I'm equal with this one. Imagine he's Amir al mumini This is justice. This is social justice. This is moral justice. Tashayu, what does tashayu mean? Tashayu means that we just, you know, hit our chest and cry for Ahlul Bayt. Or I only say, Ya Ali, Ya Mahdi, and I'm done. Tashayu is when I follow the footsteps of Amir al mumini is when I learn from him how to treat others, how to be just with others. Even if I am the governor, even if I am the mayor, even if I am the leader, I have to be one of them, one of the people. Again, during his Khilafat, one day, Amir al mumin himself, he will distribute in the city of Kufa, distribute the monthly salary to the people. So two women came to his office, small office, to get their money, their share from Baytul Mal. They came inside. One of them happened to be from an Arab tribe. The second was one of the Mawali, non-Arab. So Imam Ali gave three dinars. A dinar is a golden coin to each one of them. So when they left the office, the Arab turned to the non-Arab and she asked her, how much did he give you? She said, he gave me three dinars. The Arab lady said, he gave me three dinars too. I'm an Arab. I'm an Arab. And he gave me the same amount. So she made a U-turn. She went back. She said, Ya Amir al mumineen I'm an Arab. You gave me three dinars. She's not Arab. She deserves less. Imam Ali took a handful of dirt and he opened his eyes his hand and he said which one is better this one or that one the lady said both are same this is dirt Imam Ali said you were created from this and she was created from this there is no profit where does it say that the Arab is better than an Arab where what book in this book does the Quran say that show me where does the Quran say that? Arabs are better than non-Arabs. Where does in this book say that white are better than non-white? Europeans are better than Africans. Where? Persians better than others. Where? Only Hitler would say that. Scriptures would never say that. Scriptures do not believe in racism. There is no such holy book that puts some people above others. Even Sayyids like us, we are not better than others. We are not better than others. Yes, I'm proud that I am descendant of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But that does not mean in any way, does not mean in any way that I'm better because my blood is better than you. Maybe I have more responsibility towards my religion. Maybe. Maybe if I do something wrong, I deserve two punishments, twice. This is the meaning of it. But there is no suggestion that there is a race better than others. That's the beauty of Islam. That is social justice in Islam. And we have to be advocates of social justice, my friends, in this society. If we want to present the beauty of Islam, it's not enough to show the Europeans we pray five times a day or we fast during the month of Ramadan. That's not enough because in other religions there is fasting, there is pilgrimage, there is almsgiving, there are prayers. 
They have beautiful churches. So what is special about my religion then? If there is something special, it's about social justice. We are equal in the eyes of God. We are one family. We are one family. We don't discriminate. We don't discriminate. A day where a father or a, or a mother is willing to give his son or his daughter in a marriage to another family that comes from another culture, another color, that day is a day of equality in Islam. How many of your parents are willing to do that? This is a very major problem in our society. I hear this everywhere. Wherever I go, there is a problem. Two human beings, they love each other, they want to get married. One of them is from this country, the other is from that country. They believe in each other, they believe they are compatible with each other, they share the same values, same principles, same goals. They respect each other. But when they go back to their families, the family says, no, 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 no. No, you are, you come from this family, great family, your great grandfather, Hajji Fulan, whatever, your blood, your race, your culture, your language. How dare you, you lower yourself and you marry someone from that culture? Yeah. Do you know that, do you know that some Arabs, some Iraqis, let me begin with my culture. Let me begin with my culture, so I don't offend others. They would not give their daughters in marriage to non-Iraqis, even if they are Arab, because they think Iraqis are better. Do you know that some Iranians do not give their daughters to Afghanis? Because Iranians, they think that they are close to the moon and Afghan is down there. This is a reality. Am I right or wrong? Tell me. If I am wrong, just correct me. Tell me, say it, you are wrong, you are lying. I see this every day. I travel in America, in Canada, in Europe, in the Middle East. This is an existing problem. People who are religious, people who never miss Salatul Layl. But when it comes to another culture, another language, no, 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 no. I'm not part of them. I need to preserve my family, my blood, my culture. My culture is more sacred to me than others. We were just discussing today. Sometimes there is a convert. People convert to Islam in America, in Europe. They become good Muslims. And they try to marry someone from the Muslim community. People didn't give, don't give them their daughters. Why? Because he's a convert. They look at them as being lower. He's down. He's a convert. What's wrong with that? Look at the Prophet. The Prophet, most of his wives, most of his wives are converts. Do you know that? Safiya, the wife that the Prophet married, Safiya, was a previously Jewish. Convert. Mary al Qibtiya was a previously what? Christian. Uh, um Habiba was Mushrik, the daughter of Abu Sufyan, was Mushrik, atheist, idol worshipper. Many of his wives were previously idol worshippers. Different cultures, different religions, different. But when they accepted Islam, they are equal with others, equals. And the Prophet, the most honorable man, he married them. He didn't say, yeah, you were Jewish before, you were a Christian, so I, I have some reservation. This is a lesson for us. A lesson. Don't look down at any race. My friends, in every culture, in every race, in every country, we have good people and bad people. We have good people and bad people. Every country. So don't think that your country is better than others. Your language is better than others. Sometimes, some people convert to Islam and they ask me, in order for me to be a good Muslim, should I learn Arabic perfectly? I told him, no. You can be a good Muslim, a good, good believer in God without learning Arabic. Yes, if you want to learn Surah Al-Tawheed, Fatiha Al-Kitab, because you're going to read them in your prayers. 
But other than that, there is nowhere that says, yes, it's better to learn another language, definitely. It's better to expand your horizon. But there is no way in this book that says, your Islam is incomplete until you master Arabic language. Nowhere. I have seen some people who have good faith in God, good connection with God, good Iman, and they don't speak Arabic. And I have seen some people who are very fluent in Arabic. They are poets. They don't believe in God. They reject Islam. Yes, if we learn Arabic, we can read Quran, for instance. But you can understand this book without, without learning Arabic. You can understand the spirit of this book. There are many people who memorize this book from cover to cover. And they read it very fluently. But Imam al-Sadiq says, Quran curses them. To me, an Imam who stands in Masjid al Haram, he memorizes the Quran and he does taraweeh and he leads the prayers in the most sacred place, but at the same time, he justifies the crimes of Al Saud and he prays for them and he protects them. Quran does not like him, Quran does not respect him. He reads the Quran and the Quran is going to curse him. God says, I look at your heart. I don't care whether you memorize the Quran or not. Yes, if you memorize the Quran and you practice it and you respect it, this is extra credit, definitely. But if you memorize the Quran and you don't, you violate the Quran, then the Quran is going to turn against you. The Quran is going to witness against you on the day of judgment because you know you know what is right and what is wrong, and you still you violate because of the dunya, because of your attachment to the dunya. In this society, my friends, most of you are immigrants. Some of you are born here. Number one, Islam teaches us to love the country where you live. To love where you live. Khayrul biladi ma hamalak. What is your best country? is the country that provides for you, the country that shelters you, the country that becomes a home, to protects you. La mahammalik, not a land that overburdens you. So this is your country. What does it mean that this is my country? I have to defend it. I have to work for it. I have to protect it even if the government does not believe in God. I don't care. I have to protect the country. We separate between governments and countries. Today, few, few years ago in America, there was a good president. Not excellent, but relatively good. Today, we have a bad president. Does that mean I have to hate America? No. No, America is my country. I would love it more. I'll try to protect my country more. So if the president or this minister or the cabinet or the parliament is bad, does not mean the country is bad or the people are bad. We still have duty to protect the country, to work for it. And then we have to defend the country's interest, the society at large, not only the Muslims. We the Muslims, what we do so far, is that we always speak about our own rights, but we do not speak about the right of other citizens. Islam says when you live in a country, this is your home. Then you have to speak about not just the Muslims' right. You have to speak about the right of the entire population because you are one of them. You have to speak about health care, about education, immigration, taxes, whatever. Whatever makes your country strong and affluent, you must advocate. Not just look at Nero's perspective. Oh, I'm a Muslim. This one works only for me. I don't care about others. Today we were discussing something important. Why, my friends, why European countries are more advanced than many Islamic countries? I would not say all Islamic countries. I'm very careful in choosing my words. In many Islamic countries, than many Islamic countries. Why? Is it the geographic location? Is the Netherlands is it beautiful because of the only geographic location, it's in the north 
and let's say Sudan is in the south or other countries are in the south, it has nothing to do. Maybe geographic location would influence our akhlaq, our mood, our manners, maybe. But it's not about entirely about geographic location. It's about other human principles. One of the things that I learned when I came to the West 30 years ago, the concept of volunteerism, tawwab. Many people in these countries, they work for no return. They don't expect money from you. Some of them are young, some of them are old, some of them are disabled. I've seen at some airports in America, people who are on wheelchair, disabled. They should stay at home, relax. He works as a volunteer at the information booth. He's sitting on a wheelchair. He needs help himself. But he says, I still have some energy. My brain is functioning. Why wasting my time sitting at home? Let me go to the airport and help people out. Some of them, they have difficulty speaking, believe me. But it would not deter them from helping others. And they don't give them any money. Nobody gives them anything. While if you go to Muslim countries, if you want to move this from here, this table from here to there, they say, pay me. Pay me hajji. Pay me, I will. If you don't pay me, I'm not going to do anything. We have to spread this culture of volunteerism. Alhamdulillah, here you have this Ahlul Bayt organization. All of them are volunteers. All of them. This is good. We have to learn from that. You are transitioning into a better society. And you have to be a role model for Muslim countries. Muslims have to come here to learn from you. Many of you, you put your energy, your time, your money, despite being very busy. All of you are busy here, either students or you are working. And many of you have families and have children and have relatives and have many things to do. But still you volunteer your time. Why? Number one, because you enjoy. When you help others, you're going to enjoy. You're going to feel internal relief and satisfaction, internal, when you help. Number two, number two, you are advancing your societies. When we don't put our hands together, we are not going to progress. We are going to remain behind. We are going to be selfish. Because I always measure, when I measure success with only money, if they give me money, then I will work. This means I'm becoming selfish. I've seen sometimes people, believe me, they are well in their 80s, mid 80s. The hand is, is shivering and they still work as volunteers in hospitals, at airports, public places, schools sometimes. They don't sit at home. This is social justice, my friends. Social justice, it means I, I think about the society. If the society is good, I'm going to enjoy it. Some people are concerned about their own private individual success. If he makes money today, he's the happiest person. Even if people around him are suffering, crying, they have no food, no shelter, no medicine. But others, Imam Ali says, أَأَقْنَعُ مِن نَفْسِ أَن يُقَالَ لِي أَمِيرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَلَا أُشَارِكُ النَّاسَ فِي مَكَارِهِ الدَّهْرِ وَلَعَلَّ فِي الْحِجَازِ أَوْ الْيَمَامَ مَنْ لَا طَمَعَ لَهُ فِي الْقُرْسِ وَلَا عَهْدَ لَهُ فِي الشِّبْ I mean, the Mu'mineen sometimes says, maybe I have shelter, I have food, I have family, but there are others many miles away from me. They have no food, no shelter, no someone to take care of them. I'm not going to enjoy being called Amir al-Mu'mineen, the leader, Fulan, Fulan al-Fulani, His Excellency. I'm not going to enjoy life unless I see society being happy. When there is no orphan in the society, no orphan who's lost, the people taking care of them, when I don't see any, po any more poverty, when I don't see any more pain, that is a day of happiness for me. But I don't enjoy the society, I don't enjoy my life. Now, now, for many years, I'm not enjoying the food that I eat. When I watch on television how the children of Yemen are starving and dying of starvation. I don't enjoy the food. To be honest with you, I don't enjoy the food. I lost my appetite. 
Those people are not related to me. I have never been to, to Yemen. I don't have any cousin there, any relative. But those are human beings. I care about them. When I watch them on television, how they die, how they die, their children are dying. The richest country is just above them. And that richest country, rather than sharing their wealth with those people and giving them help and assistance and food and shelter and medicine, they are bombing them, constantly attacking them. And I'm thankful to your government, the Dutch government, that three days ago they announced no more arms sell to Saudi Arabia. Do you know that? They just announced this, announced it three days ago. It's a good government and we have to thank them and we have to support them and you have to call your members of parliament and say thank you. This is a human concept. This is solidarity with the people who are dying. We should not support their enemies who are bombing them. This is social justice. Social justice is when you, when you share the pain with others. This is why my friends, those of you who have children, how many of you have children? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Wow, this is not a lot. It worries me. Yalla, you have to begin. Inshallah, you will have children as many as you want. And you raise them very well, inshallah. Because the, the quality is much more important than the quantity. Teach your children when they go to school. Because now, the classical way is that when my son goes to school, I always tell him, Daddy, you have to study well. Do your homework. Study, study, study. Read. But this is not enough. Maybe some of our children are very intelligent, very successful when it comes to academia. But are they also successful as a human being? Do they have good hearts? Good intention? Do they put society before themselves? They are not. Why? Because we, the parents, we always tell them that, I want you to be the doctor, the engineer. I want you to be successful at school. But we don't tell them, I want you to be successful in this life, in this society. When the child comes back home, did you do good today? Did you get A plus? Did you do your homework? But we never tell them, did you see someone in pain and you went to that person, to your friend in the classroom? Did you ask him why you are in pain, why you are crying? Did you find someone today in the cafeteria when you were eating your sandwich, someone who didn't have food? Did you share your food with him? Did you sit with him? Did you see someone who didn't have a coat in the rain, in the cold? And you said to him, take my coat, share it, I'll share it with you. These are the things that makes your son and your daughter leaders, true human beings. We have to instill, inculcate these values in them. Not just to study, study, study. Ilm is good. Education is very good. But education by itself alone cannot solve our problems. Many of the criminals are educated. And they are criminals, and they are killing, and they are murdering. With ilm, we need terbiya. We need nurturance. Because we, we are made of two parts. One is aql brain, one is heart. And they need each other. You have to keep the equilibrium between the aql and the heart. You have reason, you have emotions. Both of them are important. If you, have, if you have only reason, no emotions, you're going to be a cruel person. God says to the Prophet, If you are emotionless, merciless, you have no emotion, then nobody's going to stay with you. So you need both. You need reason, definitely you need reason to incorporate reason, and you need the atifa, the emotions, the heart too. You have to feel people's pain. And once you feel it, you're going to change your society. 
That is the message of Islam. Social justice. Implement social justice in your society. If Muslim countries, they go back to the teaching of, of this book, to the true Sunnah of their Prophet. You know, today Shias and Sunnis are fighting over what? Fighting over whether the Prophet was praying like that. And many people getting killed because of this. Did he pray like that or like that? This is not important. What is important, are you following the manners of the Prophet? Are you following the forgiveness of the Prophet? The love of the Prophet? Are you respecting your parents? Are you helping your society? Are you volunteering? Are you donating your time? Are you organizing your community, your home? This is important. This is the real Sunnah. Yes, that one is also important. Sallu kama ra'aytum. We have to pray the same way the Prophet did. But this is not the real Sunnah. The real Sunnah are the manners of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His tolerance. His tolerance, his forbearance. This is the sunnah of the Prophet. He would give to those who didn't give him. He would reach out to those who disconnect with him. He would forgive those who abused him. This is the sunnah of the Prophet. These are the real sunnah. These are the ones that make a huge difference. Not minor things, fiqhi masail. Fiqhi masail doesn't, if your mind is not with God, it doesn't matter whether you pray here, your hand is there or down, it doesn't matter. Your prayers are getting you to nowhere, believe me. If you don't uphold the true principles of Islam, these prayers are not going to work, neither the fasting. But when you connect with God and connect with the humanity and you're trying to put the humanity first, then even if your prayers has some defects here or there, it's going to be forgiven. God is going to overlook. The hadith says, the hadith says, nothing can get you closer and faster to God than husnul khuluq. Husnul khuluq. If your manners are good. That is the free pass to God. That is the fastest road and the fastest highway to God. Hustle Khuluq. Hustle Khuluq with your family, with your neighbors, with your friends, with strangers outside. I mentioned last night here that one of the things that you must find in your future spouse is that he or she should have good temperament. He or she should have sense of a humor, have a smiling face. Sometimes with a small smile, you can make a huge difference in people's life. Small smile. You don't have to open your mouth up to here, no. Small, brief smile. You make a huge difference. This is the sunnah of the Prophet. This is the essence of this life, to make people happy. Making people happy. أَقْرَبُكُمْ إِلَيْهِ أَقْرَبُكُمْ لِأَهْلِهِ وَأَنَا أَقْرَبُكُمْ لِأَهْلِهِ Wow. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, The closest one among you to me are those who are the closest to their families. And I am among you the closest to my family. I'm number one when it comes to my family. I serve my family. I love my family. The Prophet, Rasulullah, the greatest man, when he sits with Hassan and Hussein, he plays with them. He crawls. He plays with them. Hussein comes and he rides the back of his Prophet in the prayers. Salatul Jama'ah, the mosque is packed. And the Prophet pro prolongs his prostration, sujood. So when he finishes the Salat, the companions, they came to the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, Asahot am uhiya ilayk. This sujood was prolonged. What happened? Did Jibreel was talking to you, bringing revelation, wahi, or you were confused? He said, Kullu hadha lam yakun. Neither Jibreel was talking to me, nor I was confused. Wa innama ibni hadha imtata dhahri fa karihtu an a'jilah. This little boy, Hussein, was riding my back, and I was praying. I want him to take his time, enjoy the ride. Imagine the Prophet is praying. 
because he does not want to break the heart of this baby. I give him enough time, so he disembarks, then I raise my head. These are the adab. These are the manners of our Prophet. This is the sunnah. This is the real sunnah. And then see how we treat our children. In some Arab countries, sometimes I see some clips. A teacher who's supposed to teach them manners. In the early morning, the teacher, he receives the kids with a slap on their face. Ta'al, ta'ah, 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 the second, the third, the fourth. He enjoys this. This is his physical exercise. In the morning. Have you seen these clips? Huh? Sometimes, do you see them? It's hard to break in. In Muslim countries, we have to change that culture. And if we do not change that culture, we are going to remain where we are. We are going to see more refugees. We are going to see more wars, more bloodshed, more bombing. May Allah protect you and bless you all, inshallah. Thank you for coming and listening and participating and sharing. And I'm very, very proud of you guys here, the Ahlul Bayt organization. I'm very proud of our sisters, our brothers, the volunteers, those who put their energy, their time, their love into this program. Your program is one of the most successful in Europe. So congratulations to all of you. And continue doing this. Continue having men and women together. Continue this civil discourse and civil dialogue. And continue asking important questions. Don't be shy. Continue challenging your religious leaders. A religious leader is not infallible. A religious leader does not speak on behalf of God. God has one spokesperson, and that is the Prophet and the Imam. And we, the religious leaders, we may commit a mistake. We may have errors. We may have miscalculation, misinterpretation. We are not immune against that. Continue asking, continue learning. And through open-mindedness, through these inquiries, you get closer to God and you start loving your religion more and more and more. May Allah bless you all. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.